Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. And welcome to this week's show. And uh, this week is a live show if you're listening on WVBR. So uh, feel free to come into the, uh, well, the message. there's a message box now on the website. It's not a chat room anymore. I took that out because people seem to not like it so much. Uh, people have been using the message box, so that is great. If you go to the website, it'll pop up, and you can just shoot me a message, and uh, you can do it anytime, really, if you want to know something about the show, and as soon as I get it, I'll respond to you. But if you want to do it during the live show, if you have questions or comments, I will pass them on into the live show, again, if you are listening on WVBR Live. And tonight's guest is uh, the one, the only, Mr. Jim Harold. Hello, Jim. Hi, how are you, sir? So good to be with you and your audience. Uh, I always get such great great reaction from the show. You have a you have a very active and, and significant audience. So I, thank you again for the invitation. And, and 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 as I told you, I'm absolutely humbled at the the awesomeness of the listeners to this show. They they completely blow me away. Um, I never expected it, and I couldn't be happier with the people we have listening. So, yeah, I, I think you should be, and you should be congratulated. You've provided a kind of different kind of forum. Yeah, I, that, w that was what I wanted, and that's why I figured no one would care. It would be too different. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't feel badly. I felt the same way when I started my podcast. I, I didn't think anybody would pay any attention whatsoever. Hmm. Well, you were Pleasantly wrong. surprised. <laughs> <laughs> we both were wrong. Thank goodness. And uh, you have a new book. New, bleh, new book. <laughs> Let me try and talk here. Um, Campfire Stories number five. Yeah, it's True Ghost Stories, Jim Harold's Campfire number five. And for those who have never heard of me or the books, uh, basically I'm a podcaster. I've been podcasting since 2005, and one of my free podcasts is Jim Harold's Campfire. Been doing that since 2009, and people come on and tell their stories of the strange. And for the last few years, pretty much on a yearly basis, We've been putting out one book of the best stories, uh, and each book contains 70 stories from our callers from all around the world, and this one is no exception. It is out now on uh, both Kindle and the Dead Tree version <laughs> as well, the electronic <laughs> or old school, and you, it's over at Amazon, and we're excited about it and excited to be on the show tonight. Awesome, awesome. And I just uh, I actually just finished this a little while ago before we went live here, and uh, it's, it's as enjoyable as any of the other ones. You get a good mix of stories. It's not like you're reading the same story over and over. Uh, you had some really some, some real head scratchers in there as well. I think you even titled one of the sections head scratchers. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. The thing I love about doing the show, and I mean, it happened again literally this week. When I record the show, you know, after having done, uh, I think I just completed the 281st episode of Campfire. And every show has several callers. So that's they're probably somewhere around 1,500 stories we've heard on the show, just wow. spitballing it. And the thing is, is that I always think, well, I've heard it all. And then <laughs> suddenly somebody this week came on with a story about uh, being in a haunted hotel room where someone had unfortunately been murdered a month before. And uh, it's just uh, uh, people always have something new and, and, and something fresh. And, and that's why I think uh, people like it, and, and I like doing it. It never gets old. So, yeah, and, and although – Probably what twenty thirty percent of the book is ghost stories. About thirty percent, I would yeah. say, is is ghost stories. Then we've got some black eyed kid and shadow people stories. Then we do a little bit of Bigfoot, a little bit of yeah. Ouija, a little bit of UFO, and then we've got a, a significant section on head scratchers. Those are ones that are hard to categorize. They're just kind of like, well, what was that all about? And those are some of my favorites. And then the last part is the softer side of spooky because. Um, in addition to all the scary stuff we talk about, we talk about people who maybe get a sign from a loved one on the other side and those kind of things. And that's a good percentage of our stories, too. So we like to make sure we dedicate a, a part of every book to some of that, too. Yeah, and that's very cool. Um, so let's, let, let's talk about one of these stories. Let's, let's go with a short, simple one that I was really amused by. Uh, ghost Legs. Oh, Ghost Legs. Yeah, this was Jenna from Oregon. She said that she had lived in a haunted apartment for a couple of years. It was in Silverton, Oregon. 
and uh, it was historic. And she said from the first time she saw it, it had a lot of character. And she had several experiences. She said as soon as she started to move in, things started to happen. It seemed like whatever it was in there was trying to communicate. She would hear voices at night, things moving around. And then she started having strange dreams. And she said they always got her right in between the waking and sleeping state when she was just starting to, to wake up. Now, the strangest thing that ever happened to her was the story she called Ghost Legs. She said it was summer and she was very hot in the apartment. So she was sleeping on her couch in the living room. She woke up and she said standing in front of her were basically a disembodied pair of legs. Nothing else, just a pair of legs. That would be very odd to see. She said yeah. she screamed. And she said it seemed to surprise the legs. And she said all of a sudden these disembodied appendages were dancing all around. Jenna said she went to set up and the legs jumped over her. They tripped on her trying to jump over the couch, fell on the floor, and then scattered away. And then she was completely awake. Now, she was laughing because the whole situation seemed so ridiculous. She figured she was uh, just dreaming. But later on in the morning, she noticed she had a bruise on her leg. It was right where the ghost leg's foot had tripped over her. So she said, rather than just a dream, the legs have must have been actually there. They literally made their mark. She said the ghost legs didn't follow her after she left, but she kind of wishes they would have. They were funny, and she said there were a lot of personalities and spirits in that particular building, and maybe the legs represented one of the more playful spirits. So that's Jenna from Oregon, and that's her story about ghost legs. Yeah, and, and it's almost slapstickish. Yeah, it is. It is. And, and you know, I think that, uh, to me, it kind of gets on a theme that if you buy into the idea that there are ghosts, that they're kind of like, the other side, I think, is kind of like our side. There's good. There's bad. There's happy. There's sad. There's playful spirits. I mean, I don't think that, Whatever's going on, I don't think it's just people sitting on clouds, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> strumming harps, you know, or, or something. Or, or a psychic once told me, I said, well, what are people like when they get over there? And she said, they're basically the same. And, it, you know, if, if Uncle Fred wasn't very good with money uh, during life and he tries to come through and give you financial advice, for goodness sake, don't take it because he's still the same person. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um Let's let, let's go to one of the really creepy ones, the man with the medallion. The man with the medallion. Yeah, this was one of the spookier ones. This came from Ed from uh, Tennessee. Now, he said as a kid he was petrified of everything. And after this story, I could see why. He said one of the scariest things that ever happened to him was when he was seven. He was lying in bed at night, and he looked up. And at the door, he saw a figure of a man. His features were completely detailed. He had a beard, dark hair, and piercing, glowing eyes. And the man had a dog with him, a German shepherd. The man wore a red shirt, blue jeans, and had a medallion on his chest. And he said that even stranger is that he had greenish skin. He couldn't take his eyes off of him. It was like he was in a trance. Now, uh, as the door began to open, he began to scream and throw pillows at this man with the medallion. Uh, Ed's father heard the commotion and ran into his room, and the man was gone. He said what scared him the most about the whole thing was the medallion. He didn't understand what it meant or signified. But this is one of those stories, a lot of stories will end right there. Okay. Right, right. But this is one that continued on. You fast forward several years. Uh, the family had moved uh, a couple of times and uh, uh, Ed's aunt had moved in with them. And he said they now had a house with an attic and they used it as a toy room. And they said, Ed said there was a feeling of dread when you went up there. And his aunt even refused to go up unless it was absolutely necessary. Now, one day, Ed got home from school, and everyone at the house was freaking out. His aunt had gone upstairs to get some stuff from storage, and um, Ed's mom said that suddenly she heard screaming like someone was trying to kill the aunt. Uh, Ed's mom quickly ran up the stairs with a bat in hand. She found uh, the woman saying there was someone up there. After they calmed down, they described the same man Ed had seen years ago in the bedroom. The description was a total match from the skin collar to the clothes to the medallion he wore, except no dog this time. Hmm. So, that's not the end of it yet. Another four years or so passed, and Ed went to Puerto Rico to visit his family. He, they were sitting around telling stories, as families often do, campfire stories. 
And a cousin shared a very interesting one. He lives in the mountains of Puerto Rico, and there their homes are built on stilts. And one night it was storming, and uh, uh, this cousin opened a window. He said, I saw this guy outside my window, and he was just standing there looking at me. And again, the description was of the same man. No dog, but <laughs> the same man with the medallion. Now, the weird thing, this house was on stilts, so this room of the relative was on the highest part of the house. Uh, it would have been a 15-foot drop. Literally, this vision was floating in mid air right outside the window. Now, all different members of the family have compared notes, and it's always the same man. And Ed says he thinks this man was trying to tell him something about the future, but he's not sure. Now, he's not seen him recently, nor has anyone else in the family. But he thinks that the medallion is the key to this story in some way. He said it was a golden pentagram and very bright. He said his mom passed away at the early age of 35, and she always felt that there was something haunting the family. She would pray and light candles, and uh, the family has always seen strange things, including, uh, including this uh, man in the medallion. Now, Ed says he's a man of faith now. And he believes faith provides spiritual protection, so he isn't afraid anymore. But uh, that's Ed's story of the man with the medallion. And to me, it, what's interesting about that story is just the collaboration, collaboration, uh, uh, corroboration, excuse me, not collaboration, corroboration of different members of the family seeing that and kind of the validation that comes through. It wasn't just Ed. It was an aunt. It was a cousin. Multiple people in the family saw the same thing. Yeah, yeah. And you put that in your ghost section, but I, I almost feel like that belongs more in like the head scratcher section. Yeah, that might be. It's always tough to some of them are like, Well, it could go this way, it could go that way, you know? It's just kind of you know how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. <laughs> you know, just try to figure it out the best you can. Some of them uh, really belong in two sections, and you're probably right. That's probably one of them. Because I mean they didn't see anything that entailed that it was a, a ghost necessarily. No, that's true. I should have asked you first. That's a good point. <laughs> I'd send you a galley copy and say, how should I? Because you got a good point there. I, mean, I kind of considered a ghost, but now that you mention it, maybe more of a vision, yeah. I mean, and it's weird with the pentagram as well. Was it a pentagram or a pentacle? He said a pentagram. That's what okay. he said. Now, that might have been a mistake on his part. But yeah, he said a lot a of people don't know there's a difference. But that that is really interesting. I mean, the fact that he was green as well. I mean, it's just, it's just bizarre. Well, I wonder, you know, particularly, obviously, if his family's from uh, Puerto Rico, uh, he's Latina, uh, Latino, and and you know, I know there's uh, a lot of belief in different kind of uh, there's magical traditions in that culture, and you wonder maybe somebody put a curse or something on I, I, or on mm -hmm. the family. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, I, I I really don't even know what to say about that one. That one was just really unique. It is, it is, and um, and uh, uh, I will say this. I, I and this is a a great compliment. I am very uh, I, I'm, uh, and through this book we have several stories. We get great support from the Latino community, and uh, because I think that they're so much. Uh, uh, closer to this, and there's an intense interest, and I'm always very, very gratified by that support that we get, and we get some great stories from that community. Well, I, I, I think if you're open to this stuff, I mean, I think most people probably have had experiences, whether or not they acknowledge them or even see them, may be a different thing entirely. Yeah. Um, so if you're more open to spiritual things, I think you're more likely to be able to actually perceive the stuff if it happens. You may also be more likely to ascribe something spiritual to something that's not, but, you know, that's the, the, you know, balance line that any any of us is going to work with. And then, but let, me, let me just say something, and I'll use this story as an illustration. You know, sometimes people say, particularly, like Ghost Legs, the story would be a great example, where someone would say, well, that was maybe uh, a dream, and then she tripped over something and ascribed it to Ghost Legs. You know, maybe mm -hmm. it was it, maybe she saw Ghost Legs, but maybe it was a dream. And I, I think that's a possibility. But with this story... Assuming Ed is being 100% truthful with us, and I have no reason to believe that he's not, uh, because there's nothing really for anybody to gain by coming on my show and telling these stories. Right. Um, and, and I do select the stories because people say, are they really true? And it's like, well, 
I believe that the person telling them believes they're true. Yeah. Uh, okay. I, I pick the most sincere stories. So my point is, is that what would be the rational explanation for this for multiple family members seeing the same thing, particularly family members? I'm assuming the family members in Puerto Rico uh, were not like on a, you know, constantly talking to each other about little experiences that happened to them. So totally independently, years later, somebody in Puerto Rico in that same family describes the same thing. To me, that kind of says, well, what is the logical explanation? I don't think there is one, really. I, I mean, I can't think of one. Yeah. No, I have no idea. And uh, if you're going to make up a story, you're going to make up something that's not that weird. Because you're going yeah. to want you're gonna want to make up something that people could say, well, I've heard stories like this. It might be true. Not something right. that's so weird that people are going, what? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I do believe, I mean, people say, ah, you know, you were really smart to get in on this paranormal craze in 2005, you know, and it, uh, you know, when it was really getting going and stuff. And, you know, this is your, you know, your full time at this and you this is your business. And it, I am full time of it uh, and I am a full time podcaster and we have the books and other things we do. But th the point is, is that I still am interested in it and I still uh, believe that there's a certain amount of this that is supernatural. Now, I any one case, I can't say with 100% sure. certitude that it's supernatural, but I believe I've heard too many stories from too many different people, from too many walks of life, from too many parts of the world, not to believe something is going on. Does that mean I believe that each and every story is absolutely supernatural? Probably not, but I believe there's definitely something going on, and that includes stories in my own family, so um, uh, of people that I know, love and trust, and, and people who I know just don't have that background to just make something up yeah um so including my own wife <laughs> you know there was a um if you don't mind i'll no, share what happened do. to her i may have shared this on the show I, I've, I mentioned this on several shows this happened before i started podcasting on the paranormal this was in 2001 shortly before 9 11 uh my mother-in-law had been very sick and she was at at home hospice actually and we knew that her time was not long for this world but we didn't know anything was imminent and one evening, my wife was over there visiting. I was at home at that point. We had one daughter, and she was just uh, was just about ready to turn two, so very small. And my uh, mother-in-law kind of was shooing my wife away, saying, you've got to go home and be with your daughter and your husband, and you can come back tomorrow, and blah, blah, blah. So I, my, my wife left, and we went to bed. And uh, <clears throat> about 1.30 in the morning, my wife looked over – woke up, looked over my shoulder, and saw a vision of Mary, uh, Mother Mary, Catholic. Hmm. And my, my wife's family was Catholic, is Catholic. And, um, you know, she said it was the most serene picture she'd ever seen. Nothing like what you'd see in the movies or depictions or those kind of things. And uh, she saw her. She looked very peaceful. And then my wife went back to sleep. Now, the one thing you should know is that Mother Mary was very significant in, like, the spiritual life of my mother-in-law. Uh, she was a big fan. <laughs> uh, you know, she brought Mother Mary roses when she, uh, when she uh, got married, and it was just very much so. And this story is actually, I think, in the first or second book. I think the first book. Anyway. Hmm. So the phone rings maybe about a half hour later. It's my father-in-law. And uh, my wife answers, and he says, she's gone. And my, my wife is just not thinking. She's like, who's gone? Your mother. Your mother just passed uh, about a half hour ago, about 1.30. And uh, my wife took that as a sign, you know. Right, uh, right. Uh, that, that, that was a sign that her mother ha had passed. And then the next day, what was interesting was is that my my father-in-law, who's still with us, and they have a little uh, ranch house, a little suburban ranch house, and they have this uh, little mail slot. I don't even think they put them in houses anymore, but a little mail slot that you drop the mail in. And uh, when my wife was over there getting the mail the next day, there was in the mail a bunch of red roses, rose petals, and my mother-in-law loved red roses. The funny thing is there's no um, red roses in my uh, in-law's yard. Or anyone near them. So it was kind of like a double whammy of signs. Now, my wife has an interest in this stuff, but nothing nearly as intense as I have. 
and she's not someone given to fancy. You know, she has an advanced degree or master's degree. She's a speech therapist. I mean, she's not, you know, she's not sleeping with a pyramid under her bed. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Uh, or trying to, you know, figure out chakras or anything like that. Uh, but there's other stories in my family of similar type people who don't have a history of making stuff like this up. So I don't know what the explanation for it. It could have been a weird coincidence in a dream that my wife had. Maybe. I doubt it. But it, it could be. I couldn't rule it out. But I, I think that all of that, uh, you know, kind of informs my interest on this this whole subject. Sure, sure. And, 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 I, and I wonder, like... I mean, because people see things that correlate with their beliefs all the time, which either suggests that everything is true or things adapt to us. So maybe right. whatever she experienced was something that she then translated into that vision because maybe. it meant something to her. And right. that was what it was trying to communicate anyway, is that it had this meaning to it. Right. Yeah. I think that's possible. I'm not, I'm not saying that... Uh, her religious worldview is the right one. I'm not saying that that proves it, uh, that. Uh, what I'm saying is that that, to me, signifies there's some kind of connection. And I mean, there's so many reports of when people pass and people seeing visions and signs and getting feelings. I think there's something to that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's let's jump to, to one of the weird ones, the sassy doppelganger. Oh, this is one of my favorites. Yeah, this one was great. Thing. Well, it's just so weird because, yeah. the you know, I started this show, you know, I thought it would be all ghost stories and nothing else, but uh, some of the real weird ones and out there and doppelgangers are one of the things that, you know, maybe two or three times a year, I'll get a really good doppelganger story, which is a really mind blower. This is from Luke in South Carolina, and this happened to, uh, I guess he went to school with uh, a, a friend uh, who was a girl. Uh, she was 18 years old and they, uh, she lived in her home uh, uh, trailer with her mom. And uh, her mom and her would get off uh, school and work about the same time every day. And one day, one would get home first, and the next day it would be vice versa. This day, um, the mom got home first, or at least she thought she had. So the mom was sitting there relaxing. It was right around 3.30. She was expecting her daughter to come through the front door from the school bus. All of a sudden, she hears her daughter's bedroom door down the hall slam and her daughter walks out into the living room and starts telling off her mother saying blank you mom i hate you you're horrible you're the worst mom ever and i wish that you would go away and die and then the girl stormed back down the hall slammed her door well, that would be pretty reprehensible yeah. if it weren't so weird because what happened just as that bedroom door sl slammed, the front door opened. Guess who walked in? <laughs> the daughter. And the, the mom was totally flabbergasted. And uh, the mom actually ran out onto the porch and watched the school bus pull away. It would have been physically impossible for them to be in the same place, this girl, to like, go in the bedroom and immediately pop back in the front. So the only other explanation was it was a doppelganger that uh, cursed her out in, in kind of an evil doppelganger. And the interesting <laughs> thing was they had a great relationship. The daughter was very respectful and had a great relationship with, uh, with the mom. And the mom had just been read the right act by a doppelganger. Now, apparently, uh, they decided after a, a couple months – to move out of that trailer, <laughs> and I don't blame him. <laughs> but that doppelganger thing, and that's happened um, multiple times on the show. I, you know, is that, you know, we've done a show recently, and I'm sure you've done shows about the Mandela effect, and this idea of parallel universes and jumping tracks uh, and jumping universes. Uh, it makes you wonder: was it like some uh, dimensional overlap? I mean, is it some evil imposter? The the mind kind of goes crazy with all the possibilities. Yeah, it's definitely a hard one to, to pin down what that would have been, especially it's being such a physical representation. Right, exactly, exactly. And the fact that the mom was absolutely convinced that the first girl that came and cursed her out was real. Right. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, that's one thing, and I know this is apparent, you know, you know your kid. Right. You know your kid as well as you know, like, the back of your hand. So for somebody to walk in and be a perfect copy 
and kind of say, whoa, why did my kid just curse me out? You know, <laughs> pretty wild. Um, let's look at, uh, oh, let's go on the cryptid ones, the cryptic monkey demon, because this one was kind of amusing. Yeah, this was this was a fun one. And, you know, cryptids, we don't get as many uh, as many as those uh, stories as we'd like. I'd love to get more. I just did a fun interview for my Plus Club show, Cryptid Report, with a gentleman who uh, wrote a book about uh, living with Sasquatch. But anyway, hmm. um, this particular one is from Jocelyn down in Florida. And she tells a story. She was 14 years old when she encountered what she called the cryptid monkey demon. She said she'd just come home from school and was relaxing in her bedroom reading a book. After about 15 or 20 minutes, she heard a, the tree right by her window swing back and forth violently. So it was a beautiful spring day, so it made no sense. Then something started to bang on her window. Now she looked outside. There was no storm, and it was a bright and sunny day. So she grabbed her brother and sister and ran outside. It turns out that her neighbors and everyone down the street standing on the sidewalk was just pointing up at this tree. She said when they walked over, there was a dark creature in it. She said this thing looked like a monkey, but not a normal one. It was screaming and hollering. The sound it made was hard to describe. She said it's like something out of the movies when someone was possessed and they have multiple voices, probably like a harmonic thing she's talking about. Hmm, she said yeah. in this case it was more like multiple animal noises. She said it was creepy and very loud. It was jumping from branch to branch, leaving a trail of fallen leaves in its wake, screeching and making a big fuss in the tree. Everyone was dumbstruck, thinking, what is that thing? Now, she said they didn't know what to do. They said... She heard a neighbor say that he was going to call animal control. So uh, Jocelyn and her siblings just decided to get out of there before someone got hurt by this thing. She went back to her room and grabbed her book. Then the noise stopped. The tree wasn't swaying, no screeching, nothing. It was dead silent. She crept over to the window. She was afraid to look out, but so, so slowly she parted the curtains. There was nothing there, which was weird. She ran back and told the brother and sister, there's nothing in the tree. They ran downstairs and out the door, and they arrived at the tree, and the weird monkey was gone. They checked around the apartment, over the fences, and on the street. They couldn't find a sign of anything, just fallen leaves and branches on the ground. It was the oddest thing ever. She said, thank God it was her first and only encounter with that cryptid. But, I mean, what would have that even been? Yeah. I, I don't really know. Yeah, that's, that, that's really bizarre. And kind of amusing, too, when you think of the description of it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And... The, that's, you know, that's something that I don't, I, you know, I'm a little skeptical, I would say, of Bigfoot, but I do believe there is possibilities that there are strange creatures and beasts we don't understand. I do believe that's possible. I mean, particularly if you're talking about something in the ocean, I think that's absolutely oh, yeah. plausible. It gets a little more difficult when you're on land, but uh, who knows what's lurking out there. Absolutely. Um well, let's let's do eerie visions because this this guy was actually living in Rochester, which is not too far from here, uh, if yeah. I remember right. Yeah, this is Alex, um, uh, and uh, he said that. Uh, and I was just uh, I was at Rochester not that long ago. My daughter was looking at the University of Rochester, so mm. <laughs> so when I read this again, I'd forgotten about this story, and I'm like, ooh. <laughs> so anyway. Uh, this is Alex from New York, uh, in, in New York State, of course. And he said he had an ability since he was a kid. He closed his eyes and see a purpley mesh image, which would eventually form into geometric shapes into, into a silhouette. He said he started doing it when he was a little kid. And he said it's kind of hard to explain, and he's had some weird experiences with it. Now, this was in the summer of 2000, and as you said, Rochester, New York. And uh, his girlfriend and he were coming back from a friend's house. He said it was a typical Saturday night around 1 or 2 in the morning. Uh, she wanted to go to Highland Park on the way home. She had a weird feeling. He had a weird feeling about it, but he said, okay. She was insistent, so they went. Now, he said once there, they walked around for about 10 minutes and sat down on a park bench. He decided to close his eyes, and he started this visualization process. He said he got a flash image of a guy coming up behind both of them and slitting their throats. He said it was so creepy. He said he gasped, he opened his eyes, and he sat up a little bit. He thought, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> he said he looked behind him. Now, this is what's freaky. He said he looked behind him, and sure enough, there was a guy about 10 feet away from them in a bush, just staring at them. Alex turned around and looked him right in the eye and said, what's up? 
The man stared at him for one or two seconds. He said, nothing. <laughs> and then he just walked <laughs> off. He was totally freaked out. He turned to his girlfriend. She just started crying, and they hightailed it out there. Now, he said, um, another time, uh, something weird happened with this was around the same time of night, he was in bed trying to get to sleep, uh, or around the same time period, I mean, and he would often use his ability to do this to kind of lull himself to sleep. He said, on this occasion, this scary, almost demonic face formed. It felt malevolent, and it came straight at him. He gasped and sat up in his bed and thought, oh, my God, what was that? He said he took a deep breath and calmed himself down. About 15 or 26 later, uh, seconds later, his little brother, who was maybe four, to five, or four or five at the time, started screaming, Mom, Mom, there's something in my room. <laughs> He didn't say it was a ghost, but he was terrified. Alex says that he shut that ability off shortly after that. Too many weird things had happened. There were just two of his experiences. Sounds like there were others. Because he's not sure what he was tapping into, and he thinks it was better to leave it alone. I and know. I would, I, I, but, but the one saved him, I exactly, guess. You know, if you yeah. think about it. Yeah, that one in Rochester, I mean... You know, and um, maybe that was just a coincidence, but that's a weird coincidence. Yeah, yeah, it would definitely creep me out. Absolutely. Um, and, I, and I wonder if he was entering some kind of meditative state where he was just open to information about his surroundings. You, you know, know, that's a good, that's a good thought. That's it, a good thought. Maybe, maybe it made him more open in general, uh, yeah. maybe to uh, information and also maybe other more sinister kind of beings. Who sure. Knows? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Let's see. Uh, let's, do, let's do the red man on the couch. This is really one of the, odd one. the weird, weirdest one. Uh, this is one that I really don't know what to make of. Uh, it really is, I would say, maybe the weirdest story in the book, and it's, it's disturbing, uh, and I'm not quite sure uh, what it means. This is Melissa from Florida. And uh, she said that uh, she listens to all the Campfire podcasts, and she's heard listeners mention seeing a strange red man, which we have had callers say that. And he, she said she had a series of experiences with this phenomenon in 1993, and she wanted to share. She was about seven years old, and they lived in an apartment complex. Every single night around 3 or 4 a.m., she would hear the creaking of our front door opening. She said she would look toward the living room and there would be a mist forming like you'd see from dry eyes. And she said all of a sudden a man dressed in completely red from head to toe would be hovering in the air in her living room. She said she never saw any feet so it didn't look like he was walking. She said she would see the red man floating towards the couch and he would sit down and just stare at the wall. She said she never saw his face because every time he turned towards her, uh, she closed her eyes. She said the red man did not look like a monster, a demon, or anything like that. He seemed like a person. But Melissa knew that he wasn't. He would appear for about 30 seconds and then he'd be gone. She would only see him in profile, but he seemed menacing. He emanated a negative, malicious feeling of doom, she said. She said there was also a rotten smell that seemed to come from nowhere. It reminded her of the garbage of garbage as it wafted through the apartment, and it would dissipate once he left. Uh, left, and she said that was a nightly occurrence for about a year. Now, how horrible would that be to live with that for a year? She said, as quickly as it all started, the red man stopped visiting, and she never saw him again. She said that apartment had a lot of activity. Things would move around on their own. Objects would just fall off the counter, even when they weren't close to the edge, and lights would turn on and off by themselves. It was a freaky place, but nothing was weirder than that red man. And uh, the thing that I would say is some of the stories, uh, you know, people have to realize, you know, somebody said, well, it's not a satisfying ending. You know, what, what was it and things. <laughs> but I, I literally write what the people say in the show, right. and then we, we edit it for flow. But I don't accentuate or, or add something into it. You know, maybe a writer might have said, and then I found that a man that had red hair died in the apartment or someone was a <laughs> right. Satanist and they were in the... But the thing is, I don't do that. I mean, I think it's important to communicate these stories. Uh, you know, of course you have to edit for flow and, and to make it read a little better and those kind of things. But I don't want to gin up or, or add things to these stories because they're more true to life. It may not be as satisfying as a story you might 
read in a fiction book, in a Stephen King book, or, or see on a TV show or see in a movie. But these are the things that happen to, to real people. Now, some of them are very dramatic, like this one, really freaky. Some of them are quite simple. But I try to make them as true to life as we possibly can. Yeah, and that's what you should be doing. I mean, you're not you're you're not intending to put fiction out here. I mean, you're, right. you're taking these people's words that these are stories that truly happened to them. So you can't just cap an ending on there to make you know to give people exactly. closure. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, and I think sometimes it's more valuable because it also makes people think. Yes. Because the thing yes. is, as I found, and I, I don't know how you feel about this. I mean, I. I, I you know, and I, I won't say how old I am. I, I don't know if I've got a fixation on my uh, age, but I'm in my late 40s. And I started get, the first things I remember being interested in about this stuff were in the 70s. Leonard Nimoy, <laughs> in, in search, search of. of. Uh, then I love the like the Charles Berlitz books about the Bermuda oh, Triangle. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. And then also a lot of those. Um, and now you don't see them anymore, but they used to have these like low budget movies about. Uh, uh, well, they had um, one about Bigfoot, and then they had, uh, yeah, uh, you know, In yeah. Search of Ancient Astronauts, which I think Rod Serling, actually, that was like the precursor to In Search of, and I think had he lived, and I think Rod Serling was from Rochester, if I'm not actually, mistaken. Actually, he, he was buried was about five minutes from my house Yeah, in Interlake yeah, I, in New York. And what was weird was when we were at the University of Rochester, I believe, we walked right by the hospital where he passed away. I was just like, oh, my God, this is like Rod Serling's <laughs> place. You know, I'm not worthy. But but the thing is, is that, but the point is, is there was a point there somewhere. I'm sure there was. <laughs> but the it point was is the, it's, the interest in those early uh, documentaries and stuff. Yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah. Uh, so, so I've been interested in this stuff all, uh, a long time. And I always had it like kind of like everything had a neat ending and it was kind of tied together and everything was siloed, you know, ghosts over here, UFOs over here, Bigfoot over here. But now it just seems to be a huge jumble in my mind. Yeah. It's, it's become less simple as, I, as I've, quote, learned more, quote. <laughs> uh, it's become <laughs> less simple and harder to quantify and qualify, if that makes any sense. Hence why some of these stories could be in different sections of the same book. Exactly. Yeah, uh, and this next one's I think is a good good example. I mean, you put it in the ghost uh, category because I think yeah, it definitely has that feel. But it also could have been something else, and that's the one titled "Hide and Go Seek." Yeah, that's a weird one, isn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, some of the things that I do love are these stories where people tell it from like when they were a little kid, and they've never forgotten it. Like it made such an impression on them that it's something they'll remember twenty, thirty, forty years hence. This was Anastasia from British Columbia, Canada our friends up north, and she said when she was seven years old, she was playing hide-and-seek with her sister Ariel and her next-door neighbor Angie. And she said it was one of their favorite games as kids. They would go down to the basement, black out all the windows with heavy drapes and do this in complete darkness. She said then they put towels around the doors too so to really make it dark. She said this time it was her big sister's turn to count. Her friend and her, Angie and her, thought that they'd be clever, so they piled uh, their grandmother's old rocking chair with pillows and blankets to make it look like someone was hiding there. And then both of them uh, ducked behind the door across the room and waited for the sister to come in. She immediately made a bead line for the chair, thinking that someone was there. She said, come out, I know you're there. She picked up one of the pillows from the chair that they had placed, and they threw it behind the chair. Not three seconds later, the pillow came flying back and hit her in the face. Now, remember that Angie and Anastasia were in the other part of the room. They weren't where the, the pillow flew back ostensibly from no one. Uh, Anastasia said there was no one else in the house. My mom and stepdad were both at work. <laughs> it was just the kids. Ariel became incessant at this point. She said, Angie, I know you're back there. Just come out. So Ariel threw another pillow. Then they all heard something scamper across the floor and go behind the couch. Ariel reached <laughs> over and flipped on the lights. Angie and I came out from behind the door and asked, what's going on? Ariel looked at us. How did you get over there so fast? <laughs> and Anastasia said, Angie's been here with me the whole time. They were terrified after that, and they stayed upstairs with all of the blinds <laughs> open until their parents came home. There was no more hide-and-go-seek that day. The trick had been on them. <laughs> That's a great one. Yeah, that's a that's a fun one, and it's a little cute story. But you know, uh, 
it, it's a cute story, but what did that mean? What did that mean? Was there something? Was there something there? Mm. Maybe there was uh -huh. a little, a little person in there, a little fairy of some sort, nature spirit. Could be. Hmm. Yeah, like I said, I mean, it could be, it could fall into the ghost category, or it could go into something else because they didn't actually see anything. No, so, it's true. So you don't know what to classify it as. It was just weird. Yep. Yeah, and and, 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 and a lot of these stories are like that. They are hard to classify. Um, let's go with. All right, let's do the black-eyed girl. Oh yeah, this is a spooky one. And I and I've, uh, this, I've always go ahead. you know when I started this show, I wanted to have it. David Weatherly was either my second or third guest talking about the black-eyed kids. Yeah. When I first heard them, heard heard of the phenomena, I kind of was like, no, this is an urban legend. There's nothing to this. And then I had him on, and I was a little more convinced based on his research that there was something going on. But I still, it's one of those things that kind of sits off to the side a little for me, where it's like, okay, right. I don't want to say I don't believe these people, but. Uh, it, it 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 seems so urban legendy, you know. No, I know exactly. I'm kind of in the same category, and I've had uh, I've met David. I've had him on the shows. I've actually had him uh, be a presenter. I think a couple of times for my Plus Club webinars. Nice. And he's a great guy, yeah. and uh, I really he's very knowledgeable, and he does not. I mean, I don't believe he's making anything up. No, no, absolutely uh, not. I, uh, he, and, and he's also done some very interesting work on the subject of tulpas, by the way. Yes, yeah. But anyway, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, uh, yeah, I kind of fall in the same cap. It's like, uh, I don't know about this. But this it, is a story. Uh, this is another story here. This one from Tony in Tennessee and another person who says that they're real. And, you know, who am I to say? Yeah, that well, that's not? it. That's it, exactly. And, and I guess the thing with me is it seems almost like they're too physical for something paranormal. Right, right. Yeah, but, I know what you're saying because you're expecting something more misty and ephemeral and that kind of thing. Yeah, so okay, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off there. No, 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 no. no. That's Hey, if it were just me telling the stories, I could just read them through. No, I, the back and forth <laughs> is a good thing. Um, anyway, this was terrifying for Tony, and he says it's actually still hard for him to talk about. It was about a month after he moved into his apartment, and one evening he came home from work and had a very uneasy feeling. Said he didn't know how to explain it. It was almost an impending sense of doom that came from nowhere. He decided to go to bed, and he didn't even eat that night, which he says is very uncharacteristic for a guy like him. At about 1 a.m., he heard a rapping at the door. It wasn't a standard knock-knock, but actually a rapping. Uh, now, he was near a college campus, so he figured it was just some college kids fooling around. He had to work in the morning, so he turned over and kind of forgot about it. But the rapping kept going. Finally... He walked to the door and he looked at the clock and it was 2.22 a.m. And he opened it up and he says there was a little girl standing there. She was about 13 or 14 years old. She was looking down at the ground, not at him. And the first thing she said to him was, they sent me here. Now, Tony was kind of freaked out by this, feeling uneasy the whole night. And then this girl shows up with this cryptic message. And he said, who sent you here? And she said, just please let me in. He said he felt a cold air sweep over him and his stomach was turning and he'd never felt that way before. He opened the door all the way and he hadn't even made contact with her eye contact. He was just talking in an emotionless, drone-like type voice and again she said, please let me in. He said, look, I'll go grab a phone. You can use the phone. Do you want to call somebody? She said, no, please let me in. They sent me here. He yelled by now. He's getting impatient. He said, who sent you here? And I'm getting the phone and calling the police. She turned around. Uh, he turned around and switched the light on. And she said again, let me in. He replied, no, I'm not letting you in. At this point, the girl started getting extremely agitated. She kept saying, they sent me here. Then she looked up at him and she said, this is only going to take a minute. And Tony says he's never been so scared in all of his life because as soon as his eyes met hers, he realized they were completely blacked out. Not dilated pupils, but the whole eye itself was black. He said to put him back on the heels. Then and there, he decided he was calling the police. He turned around and grabbed the phone, and when he swiveled back, he saw the girl was gone. He said he called the police, and they laughed at him and said, a little girl shows up and a grown man is worried about that. But he says he just didn't feel comfortable letting that child into his apartment before the eyes, let alone one with completely black ones. Yeah. He said 
He was even afraid to share his story on the program. He was afraid that she might come back. He said his only <laughs> hope is that somebody has the answer or possibly something that could keep these things away because he says they're not children, and I don't want another visit. And, you know, it's also interesting. I think there's some similarities to this to the Men in Black yes. stories. I think of all the stuff that Nick Redfern does and so forth, and, of course, the, the popular movies, which... You know that they're they're funny movies, but it also puts it kind of like in that joke category. You yeah, know? yeah. Uh, unfortunately, but I mean the Men in Black stories and Women in Black too. Nick just recently did mm -hmm. a book on that. Uh, I kind of see some kind of correlation here. Are these things something that they don't seem? Are they maybe shape shifting or posing as children to try to get whatever their nefarious plans are? I yeah, don't know. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the appearance of them is different in the sense of, like, men in black usually come around UFO-type encounters. Right. Whereas the, the, right. these, these black-eyed children just kind of show up at random. Like, people don't necessarily have something yep. else going on when they show up. But, yeah, there's, right. there's some very distinct similarities in the clothing and in the, in the way they act and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, but, absolutely. And at the absolutely. same time, though, you know, you're reading that, and I'm thinking, you know, it sounds like something someone would tell as a just making up a scary story. The 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 you sent they sent me here type of thing, you know. Not to say that he was making it up, but it just it comes across that way, right? And it, that's right. what that what's that's what gives me that pause. You know, right. it's like but, well, I I, yeah. I mean, I think that I I think there's something too keeping a certain amount of skepticism about any story oh, sure, in the back absolutely. of your night. I, I, and I don't mean that as like a reproach to these people because, again, I picked the stories where I felt people were being sincere and telling the truth, and I do believe that. But hearing it from the outside, I can totally see somebody saying, wow, that's that's pretty out there. Not saying it's not true, but I'm not 100% sold. I can understand that. Yeah. And, and, I mean, we don't know because we weren't there. We can't for certain say this did or didn't happen to someone and i'm not willing to do that unless something pops up that's just so obvious that you're going now wait a minute right or or if it's like a story that somebody's told on reddit and this is like a slightly different you right. know if you you find stuff like that yeah. Yeah, yeah uh but barring things like that i tend to you know and sometimes you can hear a chuckle in the voice or something somebody's trying to snow you and i've had a few stories like that i, I haven't aired where i thought was obvious the person was just having a little bit of fun and I, I wouldn't say anything on the call. I just wouldn't air it, you know, Right, right. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's happened a handful of times. I got to tell you that's happened four or five times. It hasn't happened very often, but if, if I sense that somebody's, you know, pulling my leg, I'll just go along with it. And then like, okay, that goes in the trash bin. But, but that rarely, rarely happens. I mean, again, that's happened less than four or five times in the, what has it been now? Seven years I've been doing this show. Nice. And I, and I would think sometimes people will do that because they don't want to believe that right. these things happen. So they're, they're going to call, they're going to make you believe their made-up story, and then they can dismiss everyone else's stories because you believe them, so you, you're you just gullible. That's all it is. None of this stuff really I swear happens. I got one I thought one time was a Howard Stern one, and I just went along with it and I never aired it. But <laughs> I swear it was either like one of his people or maybe it was someone who was a fan who was trying to – emulate him i'll tell you off air that story but uh, <laughs> uh but because there was a catchphrase that he kept using and it's like i listened to howard stern i know his catchphrases so uh but uh I, maybe it was just a coincidence but i never aired that one it was a good story too hmm. all right let's do uh let's do lady in red we had the red man earlier yeah but oh this is a fun one yeah this is this is from 50 in texas now he had just started his new job as a security guard and he was on day shift while in training and he had another guard shadowing him and showing him the ropes. And finally, he finished the training, and they put him, of course, on the night shift. He said the first night alone was eventful, to say the least. He was walking through one of the buildings, which was laid out in an L shape. He said there were 15 to 20 offices on both sides of the hallway, and he was just checking to make sure all the offices were closed. And just as he got to the corner, he saw a lady. She was dressed in red. And 5 said, how you doing, ma'am? And she smiled and kept walking. He didn't think anything of it. During the daytime, he'd see people walking around all the time. And this woman passed right by him. And then it hit him. Wait a second. It's the middle of the night. No one's supposed to be up here. So he quickly <laughs> turned around and the woman had bandaged. And he thought that she'd gone into one of the offices 
and he wasn't sure if he should knock on the doors, but he realized there was no way she could have disappeared like that. So he went down to the security station, uh, security station and he said he didn't want to say anything to his buddy there because he said he was a little gun crazy and he was the new guy, <laughs> so he's going to leave it go. So since they had surveillance cameras everywhere, Five-O decided to take a look at the video of the hallway to see what was recorded. In the video, Five-O is walking down and looking at the doors, and when he got to the corner... His head turned, and he mouthed something. That's when he said, how are you doing, man? There's only one problem. In the video, there was no one in the hallway other than him. He was talking to thin air. His security buddy says, it looks like you're talking to somebody, but there's no one there. <laughs> and then 5 said, I knew, that was, uh, I knew then I wasn't crazy. We had visual proof. Later, I found out other people had experiences with the lady in red, and I wasn't the only one. One thing is for sure, I never went into that hallway by myself again. I love that story. That's, yeah, I mean, because it's yeah. just, and it's a simple story, but I mean, that's pretty compelling, you know. And I think, if I remember correctly, 5 went on to be, you know, full blown law enforcement officer. And I personally have great respect for our law enforcement officers. And, um, you know, I would think probably a pretty credible, credible guy who would have no benefit to making this up. So I believe something like that could have happened. There actually was a lady in red. Yeah, yeah, and wh why? Why? Why a lady in red? Yeah, who knows? I don't know the history of the the building or anything like that, but I love the idea. He was talking to. They had the video, and he yeah, was talking to yeah. Finney. That's great. Um, another another ghost one, sort of. Uh, we can do the weirdness magnet. Oh yeah, this one's a little more elaborate, and this one. Uh, this one also, I think we had another story in Oregon, the Pacific Northwest. And he said. Uh, Aaron in Oregon said about seven years ago he had one of his most vivid and memorable ghost hunts ever. He was at a bar called the Rosen Raindrop in Portland, Oregon. Now he said, unfortunately, this bar was a few weeks away from closing due to financial issues. And it was well known for having a lot of paranormal activity, but it did not start off as a bar. It was the city of Portland's first morgue. In fact, the basement still had its crematorium. Obviously, no longer working, but it was all down there. He said there were rumors that people living in the apartments above would hear footsteps or smell formaldehyde. So there are also stories that the restroom doors would rattle when you were in there. The place was supposedly haunted by a woman in a white hat who would be seen walking along the upper level of the bar. He said it was a hotbed of activity. So since they were about to close anyway, they invited a bunch of paranormal investigators, uh, Aaron included, and he said he got free run of the place overnight. They brought in all the equipment you would need for a professional paranormal investigation. From the moment they arrived, nothing went right. They would get huge EMF spikes. The equipment failed, and batteries were completely drained. He said there's one moment that would stick out to him forever. He was in the back room of the bar where they hosted a lot of poker tournaments. He should mention that the bar had a reputation for another bit of mischief. Part of Portland's history is Shanghai. If you were a stranger in town and you drank in a bar, there was a good chance you would wake up on a ship or never wake up again. They would just sell you to less than scrupulous operators to fill the crews of their ships. The rumors is, in decades past, the Rose and Raindrop was one of those bars. Supposedly, it had trap doors that would lead to tunnels out to the Willamette River. He said, if you ever have time, research Portland Shanghai tunnels. They have a dark history. He said they were investigating the back room, measuring EMFs electromagnetic fields and he was there with his friend Clyde and a few other investigators and they were conducting a basic sweep of the room while trying to get some EVPs. For some reason he felt the need to get on his hands and knees and crawl on the floor along the back wall of this room. Didn't know why, he just felt compelled and something he had to do. He was crawling along the side of the wall and he sat down on a digital recorder and tried to get some EVPs. Just as he did that his friend Clyde yelled out, oh my god look at this EMF spike. The readings they got were insane. It completely barely buried the needle for a solid 10 seconds. Then every light source they brought with them sparked and went out. The entire building went completely black, even the emergency lighting. The room was pitch black, and he, Aaron felt his body being pulled and slammed against the wall that he was crawling along. He said he couldn't get away or pull himself from the wall. There's recorded audio of him telling his friend, I can't move. You're going to have to pull me away from this wall. They're going to pull me through. <laughs> he said it lasted about 20 seconds. The emergency lights, emergency lights came back on, and he saw his friend Clyde standing over, trying to pull him off the wall. He's pulling with such force that he threw him back a good two feet. And he always wondered if there was some kind of entity there trying to relive a pastor, consciously trying to pull him down. Personally, he thought they hit a bad historical loop. All of the energies channeled up. 
and history was just reliving itself for them to see. So that's uh, that was quite a quite an experience. Aaron says his friends call him the weirdness magnet. <laughs> yeah, that's that that's one I haven't heard of before. I mean, I've heard yeah. of people getting shoved and stuff, but never being sucked into a wall. And actually, the editor of my book is from the Pacific Northwest, and he was able to verify some of the historical stuff on this, and he knew about some of it. So that was kind of yeah. neat to be able to verify that before he even put it in print. Yeah, I've actually heard about a lot of that stuff. It's pretty crazy. As uh, is almost everything in the book, <laughs> in a, well, yes. but in a good way, but in a good way. <laughs> um but it, it's it's kind of like the difference, though, is you're you're doing with the supernatural. When you look at some of that history, it's the evil that men do. It's not you know, yeah, that's right. It's not what the spirits have done to people. That's right. That's true. And unfortunately, the, I think mankind has done a lot more damage than than most ghosts. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, let's do one more, and then maybe we can do a couple for patrons. Okay, great. All right, let's do let's do the haunted girlfriend. The this- haunted girlfriend. This is one of the the sort of ghost stories, and I thought this was interesting for a few reasons. But we'll get to that after you after you tell the story. Yeah, this one uh, was from Paul uh, in New York. He said he moved into his apartment about ten years ago. The structure was built in the eighteen hundreds, and it's changed owners many times. He said right from the beginning there started to be some strange happenings, but they were subtle at first. He says he lived in the top unit, the smallest of all the apartments. It was quite cozy. He said when he moved in, he brought his cats with him. And he said, cats tend to see things that we don't. He said, one night he was sitting on his bed while reading, and it faces out towards the hallway. All the lights in the apartment were off except for his bedroom lamp. He said both of his cats were on the corner of his bed, and they were craning their necks looking at something out in the hallway. Paul didn't see or hear anything, but these cats got worked up about it, and they were all making all kinds of noises. They were following something because uh, he could see their eyes tracking it. He didn't want to bother with it so he just shut the light off and went to bed shortly after that his landlord i love this part (laughs) reached out to him and said would you keep it down at night the person (laughs) who lives underneath of you he gets up early and she hears you stomping around and all kinds of racket and paul said well i'm not usually that loud at least i don't think i am eventually lady downstairs moved out and a very close friend of paul's moved into the apartment downstairs and he asked his friend can you hear me walking around she said no but then a couple of months later, sure enough, the same friend said, I hear you walking around all the time. She described to him what it sounded like, and the timing didn't make any sense. He wasn't even home at the hour she was describing. He asked, that's weird. What does it sound like? And she said, it sounds like you're getting off the couch, walking in your bedroom, and lying down in the bed. I hear it's very distinctive. It was all very strange, and he never saw or heard anything personally. But then it really got weird when he got a new girlfriend, and that's when things ramped up. He said, we dated for a bit, and then she moved in. She told me about all these paranormal experiences she had had throughout her life. She'd seen things and heard voices. She'd moved around a lot because she was part of a military family, and everywhere she went, something would happen. Her family has experienced these things as well. As soon as she moved in, there was an uptick in the activities. When she wasn't home, she reported hearing banging on the When he wasn't home, she reported hearing banging on the doors and ceiling. There were noises that Paul had never heard before. She said she heard footsteps in the hallway, which validated the neighbor's experiences. One day, while they were both away from the apartment, her neighbor heard footsteps coming from the apartment. It was so loud that she rushed up to Paul's place. She heard something or someone making noise through the door, so she called Paul to tell him what was happening. Now, he'd left a set of keys, so I told her to go in to see what was going on, but she wouldn't because she was too afraid. Right before Paul's girlfriend moved out, he was coming home after a late night socializing with some friends. He was walking up the stairs, and he heard what sounded like pots and pans being rummaged through. He thought, boy, my neighbor must be looking for something, but it's kind of late to be cooking. It was 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, and when he got to the landing, he realized these sounds weren't coming from the neighbor's apartment, but from his apartment. Now, he happened to have gone to softball practice earlier that day, so he had his bat with him. So he grabbed it for self-defense. He thought for sure that someone was in his apartment. Swung the door open, there was nothing there. The pots were completely in order, and it was just strange. He said he never made sense of all of it until he was talking with his neighbor. She said that the noise stopped after my girlfriend moved out and wondered if she might have something to do with it. The girlfriend was about there, was there about four months, and after she moved out and things did die down. She said, uh, Paul said he listens to my show. He knows that some people are magnets for activity. 
He has no other way to explain it. It could have been a poltergeist type thing. He doesn't know. He says he's always very respectful in the house, and he never tries to call anything out, and he has never actively searched for any entities. It seems as though something got agitated while she was there. He said except for those original noises, nothing happened much before she came afterwards. A few things, but not too much. He says he lives in the apartment, and there have been no issues for some years now. Uh, and it's interesting. He says he doesn't discuss these ghosts or whatever they are while he's in the apartment. In fact, when he was talking with me, he was in his car because he didn't want to talk about it in the apartment. <laughs> he says, whatever it is, we get along and we are cool and I want to keep it that way. So one of the few things I find interesting about this, and it, it occurs in a few of the stories in this book, people will hear things breaking or smashing or whatever and uh, I think in one case they came out and things were arranged very neatly in a way they weren't arranged before right. but there was no explanation for the breaking glass and stuff in this case you're hearing the rattling pots and pans but then everything's just fine right yeah so, I don't know what that means I don't know <laughs> yeah neither, neither I do I know. yeah I, I, I um, there was one where they thought that it was a grandfather haunting a house and the, the grandmother was away and I think that the parent and the kids or grandkids were staying over and they theorized that the grandfather was upset. So they found they heard crashing glass and things. Uh, they didn't find any crashing glass, but there are a bunch of old whiskey decanters uh, and that kind of thing uh, strewn about that had belonged to the grandfather. And the grandmother, when she came home, said, oh, that's just your grandfather. He's upset that I left. <laughs> <laughs> and and you got to wonder if, like, if the noises and the actual activity are two separate things in a way. Maybe maybe they're calling on, you know, a, a sound from the past. I don't, yeah, I, I don't yeah, know what the mechanism is. Very weird. Um, the other thing is he had activity before the girl moved in, and then it ramped up. And you got to wonder if, I mean, we've, we've done shows talking about, the recurring uh, things that people will experience. I hope some people have a bunch of varied experiences throughout their life versus the person who has one experience. So this guy's only experience really was this house, uh, which right. obviously had something going on. Uh, and then when this girl moved in, it ramped up. Now, was she feeding that somehow? Was it feeding I, her I somehow? So. You know, I, I think so. And it's interesting because I think that sometimes places are haunted, but then I also think maybe sometimes people are haunted. Yeah, yeah, haunted or just have energy that manifests in, yeah. in ways that or, or, appear like hauntings. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense too. That makes. I mean, the the funny thing is, is that several years ago, one of my favorite interviews is I interviewed a Canadian journalist by the name of M Michael Clarkson about poltergeist, and he has been nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. And he said, uh, you know, I went into this as a skeptic, and the only thing that I can conclude after doing the research and interviewing people of all different walks of life is there is something going on here. Yeah. What it is, I don't know, uh, but uh, something's going on. I hope I'm not misquoting him. It's been several years, but that was the gist. He tended to think it had something to do with adolescence and their energy, which we've heard many times. Yeah, yeah. But uh, and, as I recall, that's a several-year-old interview, so I may not be capturing the, the granular detail of what he <laughs> said. But that was the gist of it. He went in kind of as a skeptic and came out saying, oh, there's something to this. Yeah, well, there, there's almost got to be. There's too many consistent reports. Like you said earlier, you're looking at stories that come from around the world, uh, from different cultures, different types of people, and there's, there's enough similarities there to say something is happening. Right. We can't agree. prove what that thing is. We can't prove what the source is necessarily. But we can say people are genuinely having these experiences. They're similar enough to say there's something there. Yes. I'm very comfortable saying that. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily com comfortable saying, well, it proves there's life after death. We, that right. may not even be the right question to ask, first of all. But, you know, if someone has an experience in it and it means something to them as well, that that has power you know whether oh, yes. it really was that loved one or not if it if it gives someone that sense of security a sense of well-being that that's a powerful experience i agree i agree i i think we're on the same page here is that um the real i mean it's a couple different levels isn't it what what's reality and what's not and then what gives people comfort not that i want people to go around deluding themselves no no but if it but it but if it makes somebody feel better um, and, and it's not harming anything in a harmful way, um, you know, it can be a it can be a good thing. So, and, and so you, it's uh, 
Go ahead. You could look at it this way, too. I mean, yes, maybe Uncle Ted did come back to let you know he's okay. Or maybe your higher self said, I need to fix this, and gave you an apparition of Uncle Ted that's not really Uncle Ted, but it means something to you because it's trying to, to, to help you. You know, it, But it's really just that's another aspect of yourself. Yeah, that's an interesting theory. I, I really think that's a and, – and the thing is that I think that it's important that – we assign values to things like, oh, that ghost, that is a, that is a dead person. But I had Lloyd Auerbach on the show one time, and uh, and he told a story about uh, a murder that kept a residual haunting that people kept seeing. But they would see the murder with the murderer and the murderee, but the murderer was still alive. Yes. He was on death row. Um, so what is that? <laughs> and, and and I would think that would lean to to like the stone tape theory type of the idea. Yes, where it's yes. recording it in the environment. Yes. Yep. So, and maybe it can be interactive after a certain point. Maybe it draws from our consciousness so that enough that it it gains its own sense of consciousness, like a tulpa, after a while, and so that that replay can occasionally interact with someone or or behave in a way you wouldn't expect it to behave. I mean, like like you were saying earlier, it's like you. At one point, you could look at all this stuff and say, well, this is one thing, this is another thing, this is another thing. But now it's like the lines get blurrier and blurrier. Yep. The more stories you hear, the more research you do, and it's so hard to say that, oh, well, this stops here. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, something like Bigfoot. If you look at the research of somebody like Stan Gordon, who says that there's a preponderance, uh, a large amount of UFO sightings around where people see Bigfoot. Right. Now, right. you may or may not agree with his research, but it makes an interesting question. Is there some kind of correlation there? It gets, it's, it's kind of like going down the rabbit hole. The further you go, the weirder, to, the weirder it gets. Yeah. Yeah. And I believe when I had Seth Breedlove on talking about his documentary uh, yes. from somewhere up here in upstate New York, he, I can't remember exactly where it was. But Whitehall. It, yes, Whitehall. Thank you. He was talking about you know the Bigfoot sighting, and then he mentions, well, yeah, and around that same time, this woman had a UFO land on her on her front lawn, and it's like, well, there's there's the other weirdness, you know. Yes, exactly, exactly. And Seth, by the way, is a great guy and a fellow Ohioan. It was really cool. Oh, that's right. We ended up going. Um, coincidentally, we were booked for George Norrie's TV show. Uh, and we both ended up flying out to Boulder together or Denver together uh, back in March. So it was really funny because it was total coincidence that they booked us at the same time and we became – he had been on the show before, but we became fast friends. And he's doing some great things. He has a yeah. Boggy Creek movie coming up uh, about the Boggy Creek monster real soon. Yes, yeah, and I think he's working with Lyle Blackburn on that, isn't he? Yep, yep. absolutely. All right, so tell people where they can find all of you. Well, jimherald.com, J-I-M-H-A-R-O-L-D.com. Also, if you love ghost stories, spooky stories, join my virtual campfire on Facebook, Jim Harold's Virtual Campfire. Just search for that. Um, again, the podcast can be found anywhere you can find podcasts, pretty much iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, iHeartRadio, and you can find all of the books, one through five, and you can read them in any order over at Amazon.com, Jim Harold's Campfire, and on Kindle. Jim Harold's Campfire 5 is only $2.99, and that's for a full-length book, 70 stories. So we think that's a pretty good deal. And plus, we have the, the paperback edition as well. And again, that's Jim Harold's, excuse me, it's True Ghost Stories, Jim Harold's Campfire 5, and you can find that on Amazon. And Soraya, thank you so much, so, so much. Oh, or being a part of the program. Uh, or, I was a part of your program tonight. <laughs> I'm so used to saying that. And now, don't you also have a podcasting thing out as well? Or am I wrong uh, on that? Uh, do you mean in terms of learning the podcast? Yes, or? yes. Well, I haven't worked on that. That's over a podcast with Jim, and yes, that course is still available over there. I haven't done much with it for a while, but that, that information is still pretty good. And uh, I really love the power of podcasting. I got to do something really, really neat because of podcasting, but I'd never get to broadcast and, and did after years of not, not doing what I really wanted to do, and it's worked out great. So I love podcasting, and I highly recommend it. <laughs> all right thank you jim and we're gonna let's see we're gonna oh we're gonna do a couple extra bits for patrons if you want to become a patron of the show we only ask for three bucks to become a patron and we give you some extra stuff we give you some uh multi-part interviews all at once and uh there's more stuff coming i'm working on more stuff 
Uh, right now, patrons got a preview of an interview I did with, uh, not really an interview, sort of a roundtable with Rojan from uh, Project Archivist and Joshua Cutchin. That was really just a spontaneous show we did the other night that ended up being two and a half hours long of all kinds of different stuff. So patrons already have that. I'll put it up uh, this week or so for everyone else. And uh, you can go to com to become a patron.